it was welcome to the webster world report a program linking webster university's global system while the world is in crisis here's our host rick rockwell this is the august 7th edition of the webster world report this time we'll be reflecting on a summer of change when it comes to diversity equity and racial issues and preparing for a return to classes with the leader of webster's online learning center plus insights from the new president of webster's alumni association but first let's hear from newscaster tiara gray The Chancellor, President, and Chief Diversity Officer sent a global video message in July supporting Webster University's international students. Chancellor Beth Strobel said the Webster community was relieved the federal government had reversed course on some of its new visa policies. The presence of international students on our campuses enriches the quality of our lives and the quality of our education. Their presence makes Webster a better institution and our world a better world. The message was in response to the announcement of a federal policy that would have canceled the visa of any international student studying completely online in U.S. higher education programs. The federal government rescinded that policy after it was challenged in court. However, the government has barred any international student from entering the United States if their university has already announced it will move to completely online education in the fall. The university's virtual speaker series called Webster Speaks turned its attention to Ferguson. The killing of Michael Brown, an unarmed black teenager in Ferguson, was six years ago, Ferguson's first black mayor, Ella Jones, who was recently elected, spoke about her city. Nothing much has changed in Ferguson. We have had some economic development, uh, but the people are looking for a way to better express themselves, and they are beginning to educate themselves on the importance of voting and being a part of the local government. The program also featured Michael McMillan, the leader of the St. Louis Urban League, which has been instrumental in helping Ferguson rebuild economically since the riots of 2014, after Michael Brown was killed. McMillan spoke about how Ferguson's government and police have changed along with job prospects in that St. Louis suburb. You have the new Centene Center that is about a $30 million facility You have the new Starbucks partnership, new AT&T store. Of course, you have the Urban League Ferguson Community Empowerment Center that we bought from a a variety of different interests. And there are other things that are working together to try to move this community forward. In August, the program also featured Dr. Jamika Woody Cooper. She's an adjunct professor at Webster and a counseling psychologist who discussed racism and mental health. For me, as an African-American female, even though I'm a professional in this community, when I see sirens and I see a cop following me, I'm instantly afraid. And I'm not just afraid like, ooh, I'm going to get a ticket for speeding. I'm afraid and wondering if I'm going to make it home then. All of these Webster Speaks programs can be found on the university's YouTube channel. The next program will be August 19th about the media and race, featuring Carol Daniel of KMOX Radio and Eric Deggins of National Public Radio. Registration information can be found on the university's website. (music) Students will return to in-person classes at Webster University beginning the week of August 17th. That's when graduate classes will resume. Undergraduate students will resume classes on August 24th. Webster will require everyone on campus to wear masks and follow safety precautions as outlined by the Centers for Disease Control, the CDC. That means social distancing in classrooms and elsewhere on campus, along with encouraging hand washing and other health practices. The university's Task Force on Transition and Adaptability issued an announcement to the university community at the end of July, giving details of the return plan. 
poet Jonah Mixon Webster will join the university's English department this fall as a visiting professor of poetry. His first book, Stereotype, won the Joyce Osterwell Award from Pen America last year. Mixon Webster also won a Pen America Writing for Justice Fellowship for his ongoing multimedia project called Protocol, an investigation of policing methods in 21st century America. This year, Yale University awarded him its prestigious Wyndham Campbell Prize for Poetry. For the Webster World Report, I'm Tiara Gray. Thanks, Tiara. Vincent Flewellen has had an exceptionally busy summer. Flewellen is the Chief Diversity Officer at Webster University and the host of the university's new virtual speaker series called Webster Speaks. The program can be found online on a bi-weekly basis, and as we just heard from Tierra, those with an interest can register through the university's website to attend these sessions. Vincent reflected with us about the pivotal summer of 2020 via Cisco WebEx from St. Louis. So as we record this, we are coming up on the sixth anniversary of Ferguson and the death of Michael Brown. And so I want to talk to you about this because you have addressed this recently on the Webster Speaks virtual speaker series. Tell us a little bit about what you think the area has learned since Michael Brown, or have we learned anything? What a great question. I was actively involved back in 2014 in protesting and trying to seek justice in, a, in, in, in support for Black Lives Mattering and trying to look at reform and trying to have a voice be heard for Black St. Louisans, for Blacks across the country. It was interesting when I, when I look at the couple of protests in which I, or actions in which I've been involved in this year and do a comparison to those protests and the people who are involved today versus the people who were involved in 2014. And I don't mean individuals, like to be able to call out Joe or Richard and recognize them as being different or the same, but the demographics, the numbers. When I look at who is involved today, I'm so pleased and hopeful by the large number of white allies who are showing up to use their bodies and their voices, um, literally in many instances, standing between <laughs> law officials and the black colleagues and peers and protesters who are there and creating like a, a barrier of protection. That's hugely different than last year or last, um, when, you know, 2014, hugely different. And the ways in which the eyes of our white colleagues have been opened and this, you know, awakening and this reckoning that's taken place around racial inequities and a fight for racial justice is hugely different and it leaves me feeling hopeful. I don't know that I felt as hopeful back in 2014. And part of that is also because it's not just what's happening here locally in St. Louis. It's what we are witnessing across this country. It's what we're witnessing happening across this globe. That to me, speaks to a recognition that the eyes of others have been opened. You know, when we think about George Floyd's killing and we think about Michael Brown's killing, George Floyd was killed during this time in which we were all forced at home. You know, the cell phone captured that lynching and we watched this public lynching on television. Couldn't deny that. Couldn't deny that. Now, folks could deny and could question the circumstances leading up to the killing of Michael Brown Jr. here in Ferguson, right? 
And, and it was debated and it was questioned. We couldn't do that with George Floyd. We all saw it and we repeatedly saw it, right? And it caused us to sit in that place of discomfort, so caused us to sit in that place of embarrassment, caused us to sit in that place of outrage. And I think that that is another huge piece of this is the fact that we captured that and saw that as a result of the camera on our cell phones. Technology played such a major role in a way in which, again, 2014, it wasn't as present. Um, certainly we had cameras on our cell phones, but that moment was not captured. Um, for it to have happened during a time in which so many of us were forced to be home and forced to watch that on the news, we couldn't deny it. We could not deny that. And so I think that those are some of the changes. Um, now, you know, we start talking in terms of even the larger conversations around systems, right? The fact that organizations, institutions, universities such as ours are also now making statements about Black Lives Matter, right? 2014, I don't know that so many organizations, universities would have been willing or in fact did see the importance of making such a declaration. Today, they all understand why. And I don't think that it's all about PR that they're doing this, right? And in fact, what I know, as I think about our own experiences at the university, right, when you make such a declaration, you open yourself up to be challenged around that. And so that's not, in my opinion, a PR move that you make with the hope of now earning you know, good graces and great graces of other folks, right? You're not trying to earn favor because in fact, what you're doing is you're opening yourself up to on some level, uh, a, 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 and rightfully so, an examination of how true you are to those words, right? And that's, that's hard, that's hard, it's hard work. You know, I think that that's another huge difference between the two, those declarations that are coming out, I think that organizations again such as ours are continuing their commitment to diversity equity and, and inclusion by also saying now we also have to do some self-examination right and so what are some some policies that we can examine what are some other ways that we can do outreach what are other ways that we can draw folks in into a conversation to lead to actions and to 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 do uh to to, to make our spaces better than they were prior to this time, right? This is a great opportunity um, for us to really examine who we are, who we wanna be, and what are the necessary steps for us to take to get us there. I'm a part of a group called the uh, St. Louis Diversity and Inclusion Consortium. And there are about 195 uh, individuals who represent here in St. Louis, you know, for-profit organizations, nonprofit organizations, institutions of learning, um, but we all are in some level engaged and involved uh, in helping to move forward our institutions respectively on issues of diversity, equity, and inclusion. And one of the things, we actually had a, a, a virtual meeting this morning, and one of the things that we all acknowledge is that all of our institutions, are looking at this work differently today. And that that has positioned us in the work that we're doing in such a different light and with such great opportunities for those institutions to now turn to those of us who are in these roles and say like, okay, yeah, we've had you and we recognize your importance and we have used you from time to time, but how can you now really help us do all of this? And you know, to hear my colleagues talk about the ways in which that outreach um, and, and, and this topic has become front and center and such a priority for those organizations, I think it's just, it's, it's a real gift for us at this point. If there is to be something that comes out that of, of, of these deaths, it's my hope that it allows for us to really have these conversations for real change. I want to talk to you about another death we record this interview on the day that Congressman John Lewis is being laid to rest. How does his spirit imbue what goes forward? You talk about good trouble. 
and getting into good trouble. John Lewis, in his life and in his death, does not signify for us what is possible on so many levels. I think about the fact that, you know, as a young boy, his desires to get engaged, his outreach to connect with other leaders at that time with the sole purpose of nothing more than to make life better and to, 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 to disrupt the system to bring about change. If those of us who are living today, who watched that those, those services or who for the last week or so have been engaged in, in the ways in which his life has been honored and so beautifully so, I, 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 I'm more motivated, I'm more committed to this um, than ever. You know, I, I certainly understand Dr. King. I was not around during Dr. King's time, right? Um, but for me, I understand, I have had the pleasure of seeing his work, Reverend Lewis's work, and he was a reverend, of seeing his work and the ways in which he challenged individuals. And so for me, he represents that hope again, and, and that determination of really pushing to fight. And so that legacy, I have to bear that. I have to honor that. In very much the same ways in which I have always spoken about Dr. King and honoring his lesson, uh, legacy, you know, for me, it's, it's my honoring their legacy, but for John Lewis to have been, a, for me to have been alive during his time and for me to have witnessed that, um, work that he did is a real gift for me. And I would not be here in many ways were it not for him. We talk about the, the Civil Rights Act and we talk about the voting, you know, legislation. You know, these are all things that are directly related to him and his legacy. And so it's critically important that those of us who are committed to, to and this is not just racial equity. Those of us who are committed to the work of diversity, equity, and inclusion, you know, he, he would have been out there. He was out there talking about trans rights. He was out there talking about LGBT rights. He was out there talking about low-income individuals. He, he was not just talking about Black, the rights of Black folks. He was talking about all of those identities which are marginalized and which often are discriminated against and forgotten. And so... He truly represented our country and the fight for who we should be and how we should be. It's also interesting that, you know, in the same way he could cause disruption and be upset with the country, but also at the same time love it because he's a part of a country where it allows for you to do both. It's a lot, you are able to call it out and hold it accountable and responsible, but in the same way, you know, be able to say, and we can do better. And that's what a democracy allows. Like, that is what we are supposed to do. Um, there's a way for us to love and honor our country, but also to call it out and hold it accountable for when it's not living up to the principles and ideals on which we say it's founded and based upon. Thank you so much. Vincent Flewellen, the Chief Diversity Officer of Webster University, our guest today on the Webster World Report, joining us via Cisco WebEx from St. Louis. Thank you. Thanks, Rick. Thanks for the opportunity. We'll be hearing more about diversity and equity from an alumni viewpoint in a few moments. Plus, getting ready for classes in the fall. More from the Webster World Report in a moment. Now is the time to register for classes. Whether you're finishing your degree or just starting out, Webster University is ready for you. Our experienced staff is here to guide you through the registration process and help you prepare for the fall 2020 semester. Whether you're attending courses online or in the classroom, Webster University is ready for you. Get started today at webster.edu slash register. Welcome back to the Webster World Report. Information technology expert Alexandria McEwen is the new president of the Board of Directors for Webster's Alumni Association. She holds three degrees earned at Webster, and she's a software engineer for AT&T. 
Here's the first part of our interview conducted via Cisco WebEx from St. Louis. She wanted to talk to us about her experience at Webster as part of the Association of African American Collegians, a group called the AAAC. Um, AAAC was an organization to allow us Black students to have a voice um, and to be a part. And so I was very thankful that Webster saw that as value, you know, that was needed and that um, it was something we were able to participate in. Um, so I, was, I served as the treasurer um, during undergrad. And so we did a number of panels. Um, we had our black and white ball. Uh, we were able to bring people from other schools um, to different events on campus. So we were also able um, to be inclusive, you know, in the community, in the St. Louis area. Um, so Triple C in undergrad, it was it was home. You know, it was home we had, and it wasn't just black students. When we were in undergrad, you know, we had um, other races that were um, in our group too. So, but we enjoyed each other. Um, like I said, our voices were heard. We got to talk about certain issues that concerned us on campus, um, and administration listened to us. So um, undergrad, it was you know it was a great experience. I also think we made our experience as well, um, you know, by being inclusive. And I think AAAC is still important, even the grad chapter, um, just because we wanna be able to um, close that gap a little bit, you know, where undergrad knows that the grad, um, you know, they, the grads support them, that they have their support, that we're here for them to network with us, for us to help them um, and to guide them with anything that they have on campus as well. So I'm wondering about your view of diversity, equity, inclusion at Webster. What's your experience been like as part of all of those student experiences you've had? Honestly, um, every group that I've been a part of, I have been able to use my voice and voice my opinion when I felt something was wrong. So even um, with student ambassadors, um, I was the only black female at one point. Um, but my peers, I don't think they really paid attention to that. Um, but when I needed to say something, you know, of an issue that we had to pay attention to or something that we needed to talk about, they would listen to me. Um, and I think it's because I had already developed relationships with everyone. You know, everyone knew who I was as a person, my integrity. Um, so they um, trusted my opinion and things that I had to say. So already developing those relationships throughout the years, um, during undergrad, it even, you know, it became vital um, when I participated in things on alumni level. Do you think that the Alumni Association has a role to play as we talk about diversity, equity, and inclusion? I think so. I think um, we have to um, make a more, try to have a better presence shall I say, or develop our relationship with um, the undergrad or just even the um, university as a whole, you know, um, not just about giving, you know, of course we ask people to, you know, donate and whatnot, but um, try to foster those relationships, like I said, with the um, with undergrads to network with them, to let them know that we're here um, for them, that we support them, anything that they need. So I think, as the alumni association, I think it's our charge to try to help with help guide that, to help Webster guide that. We'll be hearing more from that interview on another program. August is always the month to think about going back to school. So this week, an interview with Michelle Loyette, an associate vice president at Webster University and the leader of the university's online learning center. Here's the first part of our interview conducted via Cisco WebEx from Ferguson, Missouri. So if, a, if someone comes to us and, and wants to develop a course for, uh, for online, we have an instructional designer that they'll work with in, in crafting uh, the content of the class and in, in setting up the plan for what that class is going to look like in the online environment. We also have graphic designers, videographer. Uh, we have uh, course developers who uh, who work on the uh, the electronic uh, learning uh, objects in the class and programming those uh, so so when when someone comes to us and wants to create a class for online what we focus on is we focus on creating a master course that 
is something that can be utilized by other people, but we have an expert that the department has identified who's going to create that, that content for that master course. And so when, uh, when you're teaching an online course, we automatically load that content that's been uh, crafted by an expert, vetted by the department uh, into that, that class. And whoever happens to be teaching it uh, then has the opportunity before the beginning of class to personalize it, to um, you know, update. Maybe there's uh, some discussion questions that needed to be updated to something more timely. What can you tell us about the philosophy of online classes, even classes that are now going to be transitioned maybe for the fall or for later. Um, what I've heard it referred to is uh, in online, instead of having the sage on the stage, the professor at the front of the class lecturing all the time, which is not necessarily the way that, that all classes are structured anyway these days, but that this will further transition professors to be more the guide on the side as the class does other things and activities. Is, is that how, what you see happening in online? You know, one of the things that, that people often are concerned about in moving into a fully online environment is this idea that, uh, and, and it's a bit of an outdated idea, but an idea that online is independent study or, or correspondence courses. You know, on, online is, is not, <laughs> but it, does it does resemble more of that um, that flipped classroom sort of environment than it does you know like you said the sage on the stage and uh, and as a graduate student I taught um, I taught undergraduate classes to um, to hundreds of students when I was a, a graduate student at, at University of Illinois. You know, there were, you come in, your TAs would wire you up with your lapel mic. And, um, and at that time, I'm gonna out myself as being, uh, being pretty old as they'd take my, my carousel of slides up to the control room. And, and certainly I've, I've, I've worked in that environment. You know, that's that sage on the stage. There's, there's no room for questions when, you can't even see your audience because of the lights that are shining uh, on the podium. But online classes, on the other hand, very much rely on the interaction between students and between the students and the professor to create that community um, that you don't have the opportunity to create in a physical sense. Um, and, uh, and so for that reason, online faculty uh, not only have to step back a little bit from that sort of, you know, simply delivering of information, but to a more interactive place uh, and allow students to interact with the materials in the course and then come back and have um, those discussions about um, their thoughts about that material, their reactions to that material, and really guide them uh, as, they, uh, as they develop uh, their, their knowledge about, uh, about the information in the course. We'll be hearing more from that interview on a later program. Thanks for listening this week. The Webster World Report will return with a fresh program on Friday, September 11th, 2020. We'd like to add your voices to our program. If you're a student, a staff member, or a member of the faculty, reach out to us. Send us a short audio clip from your cell phone or contact us via email to volunteer to be interviewed on the program. You can find us at covid19 at webster.edu. You can also send questions or comments to that email address about our world in crises. That address again is covid19 at webster.edu. Also check out the university's covid19 resources pages at webster.edu slash covid19. The Webster World Report is now available on iTunes, Spotify, Pandora, Google Podcasts, and of course, SoundCloud. You can also hear the program on your Alexa speaker via TuneIn. Also, our report is featured on KWRH-FM Radio 63119. That's 92.9 FM in Webster Groves, Missouri. Thanks for joining us this week. The Webster World Report is produced by students, staff, and faculty at Webster University. For announcer Jennifer Starkey, News reporter Tierra Gray and associate producer Jennifer Gamich. I'm Rick Rockwell. Stay healthy and safe.
The Webster World Report is produced by the Global Marketing and Communications Division of Webster University and through the facilities and copyright support of Webster's School of Communications. This program is copyright 2020.